Hi, welcome to the second reading of my book, Beasts Before Us, published by Bloomsbury Sigma, which is out this week. Uh, today I'd like to read a little section to you about um, a couple of the animals that I mentioned in this book, some of these ancient ancestors that you may never have realised that you're related to. So I'd like to start um, with a chapter called Hot-Blooded Hunters, and then I'm actually going to jump chapters um, to read a little bit about the Triassic. Before the Trans-Siberian Railway was built, it's said to have been faster to sail over the Atlantic Ocean, cross America, and then sail over the Pacific to reach the Russian Far East, rather than attempt to trek through Siberia. The railway is considered one of the greatest journeys on Earth, and in my twenties, fueled with a childhood intoxication with travel and Dr Zhivago, I spent two weeks experiencing the 9,289 kilometres from Moscow to Vladivostok, across Earth's largest and starkest continent. The journey was transformative, but I felt every mile. My shared cabin was freezing at night with ice coating the inside of the cracked window, but it was stupefyingly hot and stuffy during the day. To escape, I spent much of the journey standing in the partition between carriages. It smelt of diesel and it remained before, below minus 10, but in my solitary frozen world I watched the sparse landscape and far off mountains trundle past. There was no Russia in the Permian. It's hard to imagine that those thousands of kilometres of taiga and forest, about as distant from the ocean as it's possible to get in the world, have not always existed. Where the magnificent Ural Mountains now divide the great Asian continent in two, there once flowed a shallow sea called the Paleo-Uralian Ocean. It separated the land masses of what are now Europe and the westernmost part of Russia from Siberia, Kazakhstan and the rest of Central Asia. As the Carboniferous drew to a close and the Permian wore on, this ocean closed and the land beneath it crumpled. The folds rose to form the Urals, a 250 million year old healed scar. Russia is now part of the largest continent on Earth, but in the Permian, it was merely the head and shoulders of a far mightier Pangaea. When Scottish geologist Roderick Impey Murchison travelled across Russia and mapped the Urals around Perm in 1841, there was no railway to speed his journey. The first tracks weren't laid until 1891. It took 26 years and immeasurable human suffering and sacrifice to create the Trans-Siberian Railway. It was hacked out of the earth by Chinese labourers, soldiers, exiles and convicts. Bodies lie beneath its surface. Workers who died from floods, landslides, bubonic plague, extreme cold, cholera, anthrax, bandits and tigers. But there are far older bodies too sacrificed as the bedrock of Russia itself was assembled. Russia is one of the best places in the world to find Permian Thoraxid fossils. Whereas earlier synapses appear to have been restricted to the warmer, humid equator of Pangaea, their descendants were swiftly found all around the world in both Laurasia and Gondwana. These are not the cold-blooded, mammal-like reptiles of old parlance. They are the core of the first complex ecosystems on land, including swift hunters and dangerous browsers, climbers in the highest branches and diggers in deep soil. The height of the Permian was a dream time when the earth foreshadowed its later evolutionary plot lines. Looking at the skeleton of Biarmasuchus, and that's one of these therapsids we're talking about, it had an eager stance. It reminded me, reminds me of a bull terrier ready to chase a stick. It was a bit smaller overall, but the head has the same strong profile. And in the flesh, it wouldn't have had external ears, those skin flaps that stick out to pivot and hone sound received by modern mammals. It only had holes leading to a simple internal ear like those of their ancestors. And despite its forelimbs being a little bit more splayed to the side, you have no trouble imagining it racing across the emerging landscapes of Permian Russia, chasing dinner rather than a tossed branch. The 
Pelicosaurus of earlier days were dynamic, but Biarmasuchus and Kin were undeniably built to move further and faster. Now it's true that there were no dinosaurs in the Permian, but there were dinosphalians. The name has nothing to do with those distant reptiles other than the shared root of the word. These synapsids were not terrible lizards, but they did have terrible heads. This is a reference to their intimidating faces, with a tendency to have thickened bones in the skull, and that's called pachyostosis. But don't let that fool you. Dinosophilians were not all ferocious beasts. The group was one of the earliest to emerge, but their members included carnivores, omnivores and specialist herbivores. For a time, they became the most numerous therapsids, and their bones can be found not only in Russia, but also in China, South Africa, Zimbabwe and Brazil. One of the most charismatic dinosophilians is Mozchops from South Africa. This animal was a serious, chonky boy, longer than a super king-sized double bed, uh, sorry, super king-sized bed, and built like a nightclub bouncer. Now that bulk held the digestive chambers necessary for processing vegetable matter, because like most of the largest animals alive today, Mozchops was a plant eater. It had massively stocky shoulders and a short neck, and it shared those defining features of all dinosophilians, a thick skull and a steeply downward sloping face with an equally steeply sloping back. All in all, Mozchops looked like a triangle with legs. In 1983, Mozchops found television fame in the United Kingdom in a stop motion cartoon series of the same name. It did well enough to make it across the channel to Denmark. Like Demetrodon, however, this synapsid found itself misplaced in geological time in the cartoon, hanging out with a motley ensemble of Jurassic and Cretaceous family and friends, including an Allosaurus and Grandfather Diplodocus. But who can blame the cartoon makers? I mean, Mozchops had a face for television, endearing enough to have earned it its name, which actually means calf face. Mozchops' brother, Steminosuchus, on the other hand, had a face for radio. It was an omnivore from Russia that only a mother could love, taking the thickening of the skull to extremes. Horns erupted from Steminosuchus' head in all directions, as if someone had set off a firework in its skull. Two gnarly protrusions sat above the small, rounded eyes, and another two exploded from its cheeks. Like Mozchops, it was a real beefcake, reaching about three metres in length. A cast of Asteminosuchus' skull is on exhibit at the Royal Tyrell Museum in Drumheller in Canada. The original, along with the rest of the fossils known for this animal, is in the Paleontological Institute in Moscow. The skull in Canada is eerily lit, with its mouth open in surprise, and it never fails to elicit a similar response in the viewer. I felt a twinge of sadness when I visited the museum, watching a queue of visitors file past and photograph a stem in a for its grotesquery and doubly insult the poor beast by assuming it was some kind of dinosaur. What may seem bizarre from our perspective made this giant a force to be reckoned with by its contemporaries and was perhaps also a measure of fitness used in courtship. Similar to Triceratops and other Ceratopsian dinosaur copycats many millions of years later, Asteminosuchus and fellow dinosophilians probably developed their head adornments and this pachyostosis for defence and competition, possibly as reinforcement for headbutting. Those therapses had involved yet, evolved yet another of nature's great innovations and perfected it long before the rest of the world caught on. Now I'd like to move forward in time just a little bit and finish by talking about the Permian. Uh, sorry, the Triassic, not the Permian. I've just talked about the Permian. The Triassic. This time period, which followed the Permian, witnessed a radical rewrite of the world's fauna. The beasts that flourished in the first age of mammals were replaced almost wholesale by reptiles. Despite over a hundred million years of diversification and ecological innovation, therapsids were swept away in a mass extinction event so brutal 
that life on Earth came closer to annihilation than ever before or since. Now, thanks to the demise of the non-bird dinosaurs, it's the end Cretaceous that is the Hollywood superstar of mass extinctions. I mean, it happened 66 million years ago, but everyone is still talking about it. Now, killer asteroids are certainly headline worthy, but if death was money, it wouldn't be the highest earner. If you want the real Dwayne Johnson of mass extinctions, you need to check out the end of the Permian. The end of the Cretaceous was murder from space, but the end of the Permian was filicide. An epic 252 million years ago, the first great chapter of evolution on Earth was brought to an apocalyptic halt. At least three quarters of life died. The next geological period, the Triassic, began with a world virtually wiped clean. Things got weird, and I mean really weird. I'm talking about sprinting bipedal crocodiles and platypus-faced aquatic reptiles. There was a complete changeover of animal groups, and the modern ecosystems we know were birthed from that rubble, including mammals as we know them. It was the Earth herself who eradicated her inhabitants at the end of the Permian, and the evidence for her crime is found in the landscape and chemistry of the rocks of Siberia. And if you want to find out more about what that evidence is and what happened next, you can now buy my book, which is out this week, Beasts Before Us, published by Bloomsbury Sigma.